Uh, good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us today for our webinar, Change in the Fire Service. Uh, we have Chief Colin Altman with us today, who's going to be presenting. Um, and first, though, this webinar is sponsored by Ring. So we have a little video to share with you. Let me get this started. And here we go. We've lived in the neighborhood for 21 years. This is our first starter family home. We just moved to this area and of course, less than a year later, fire happened. There's a lot of devastation. The entire streets in the canyon completely leveled. The Woolsey fire spread very quickly. People had minutes or hours to evacuate. I just throw all of our valuable belongings and then we had to go into my daughter's room and wake her up. We just hopped in the car and tried to get out. Our homes were on fire. My wife was in a state of panic because she just said, our house is not going to make it. The idea of losing this home that was just our dream and it could all be taken away from us tonight, it was terrifying. The unknown was really hard. The news kept replaying the same videos over and over again. And the neighbors app kept it real for us because a lot of our neighbors were posting, even though they weren't home, they were sharing their videos of what was going on. We could see in the video, the winds were blowing horrifically and there were embers that were flying. It looked like the fire was very close. If you look on some of the comments, some people were talking about how they know that their family is safe or their communities were safe. I love that people were posting like exactly where it was on their streets. They would say a new spot fire just happened at the high school, which is just right down the street from us. That was more informative than the news. It was up to date. It was current. You could go on every 10 minutes and you could find something new about your community. It was an incredibly valuable vehicle for communicating and managing our personal emergency from a remote location. It just brings your community together so much in times of tragedy. It was like a support group. It was priceless. It was like being home. All right, so thanks again to Ring and Colin. It's off you go. Thank you very much, Misha. Hopefully everyone can hear me. Uh, let me get this screen share going here. All right, um, and hopefully, all right, hopefully everyone can see the slide. Uh, it says it. You can. So anyway, good morning. Thank you guys all for um, logging in, I guess. This is um, Change in the Fire Service, um, and I'm Chief Colin Altman. Thanks to the uh, OFCA for, for holding this and to Ring for sponsoring it. Um, we really appreciate their sponsorship. Uh, this was supposed to be rolled out at our uh, annual conference back in August. Uh, obviously, that didn't happen. Um, this was scheduled to go a couple of weeks ago, and unfortunately, I was unable to do it then. So here we are. Thank you all for bearing with us and staying with us. Hopefully, this is going to work. I've never presented a webinar before, so if I suddenly delete everybody, um, sorry about that. So we'll just get on going. So a little bit be about me, because that's what we always do, right? you got to talk about yourself a little bit. So I am um, Chief with Miami Township Fire Rescue in Greene County in Southwest Ohio. Um, the ancestral home of Governor DeWine, but he lives next door in Cedarville Township now. Um, we are a small combination volunteer, part-time and career department. Um, we serve about 7,000 people in four communities um, over about 38 square miles. And uh, we do about 1,150 to 1,200 calls a year. Um, so we're a little busy. Um, I've been in the fire service for 34 years, <laughs> 34 years, longer than some of uh, my guys have been alive. Um, started as a volunteer when I got to college and uh, fell in love with, with doing this, um, much to the detriment of my academic career. Um, but I've served in volunteer part-time and career cap uh, capacities, and I've been chief here for a while, a long time. I, it's hard to keep track sometimes, uh, and I've loved almost every minute of it. Um, I've also had the honor to be elected uh, 
I guess it was this year, still 2020, uh, as second vice president of the OFCA, um, where I also serve as volunteer committee chair and the board liaison to our newly formed diversity and inclusion task force. Obviously, you know, when you're in the fire service for a while, especially at the chief level, you've hopefully gotten some things accomplished um, over your time uh, and seen some changes and ushered through some changes. Um, and I guess the biggest change for me that I have had to facilitate and oversee and work through um, is our transition from almost a 100% volunteer fire department uh, into the kind of hybrid combination model we are now. Um, it's been a bumpy road at times, but um, I think it's, it's worked well and it's been necessary for our community. Um, when I came on as chief, we had myself as a part-time fire chief and uh, a full-time EMS coordinator and then 49 volunteers. And we were very active. We had a very active volunteer component um, and we had some businesses here in town, big uh, industrial businesses that kept um, people living in the community and uh, allowed them to volunteer during the daytime. And one of the things that happened is as those moved out of town or closed, um, we became more of a bedroom community and um, people have less and less time to volunteer. And it's the same story you're gonna hear all over the country and all over the state from people. Um, so the department had to change and we had to, um, to adopt, adapt. And it's, it's at times, like I said, been a bumpy road, but we've gotten ourselves, I think, to a very good place. Um, so it really kind of helped me to realize that change isn't bad and it's a good thing. And I thought um, this is something that, you know, we all need to look at in the fire service. We're not always great, I think, with adapting to, uh, to changes. So just the objectives, um, we're gonna talk about a little history in the fire service and our history with change. Talk about why change is difficult. Uh, how do we deal with the aversion to change? And how do leaders, as leaders, how do we implement and manage this change process um, through, uh, through our, our departments? Now, I will say, before we get going, I am not, uh, you know, I wouldn't hold myself up as super expert on change management. Um, that's an entire career field. And uh, there's a lot of different uh, philosophies out there and a lot of different uh, processes that you can follow. So this is just really a, a 10,000 foot overview designed for uh, to get us hopefully thinking and, and looking into things. So this was one of my uh, favorite movies in my early days as a firefighter um, from Backdraft. It's a screen grab. Um, Chicago Fire Department, 150 years of tradition unimpeded by progress. So the question is, is this really us? Is this what we're about in the fire service? And unfortunately, yeah, sometimes it, it pretty often is. Um, we love our tradition and we don't always want progress to stand in the way. We're very traditional. Um, the greatest thing I look at with this is our helmets. I love my classic style, New York style helmets and I have the guys wearing them here at work. Um, and I can't think of anything worse than having to wear the Luke Skywalker Euro style fighter pilot helmet. But um, yeah, they really are. I mean, it makes sense. It just makes sense. But, you know, we're not going to adopt them here in the United States very widely because we have our traditions and we're going to keep wearing our crowns instead of something that probably makes more sense. But what about this? You know, this was the crazy thing, at least in my eyes, that we saw over the last, what, five years probably as uh, science actually you know, started having a, its way in the fire service and, and told us that the way we've been fighting fires may not be the best way and the best safe way. Um, you know, for me here at this fire department, it made sense to me. Uh, it made sense to my staff, my officers. Uh, we trained everybody to look at these things and flow paths and everything. Um, but the resistance is insane, is insane to me. Uh, it's a change that's backed by science that'll make our job more efficient and effective and safer, um, but there's so much blowback against it. Well, we're not doing it that way. We've never done it that way. We're still putting people on the roof, uh, all those kind of things. So um, we, we have a little bit of a checkered past with change in the fire service, at least that's my opinion. So let's talk some history and how we've done um, and some different things that we've, we've done. So, First off, why, why, is change, why change? Why change the way we do things? Um, there's a couple of reasons. 
organizational change, when you change your organization, it can equal organizational growth. And that doesn't necessarily mean, I'm not talking about now suddenly we have more guys and more jobs and all that kind of stuff. It means that your organization grows as an organization. Um, you take on new challenges, you take on new roles, um, take on new technologies, and uh, we're, we're moving forward. As an organization, we totally risk being left behind if we don't continue to grow. Uh, we have, we as the fire service have tried to be based so much in our traditions and the way we do things that we do at times get left behind and looked at by other government agencies as, as we're the, the dinosaur in the room. Lack of growth in your organization can equal stagnation. You know, um, I've traveled across the state and visited different fire departments and I've seen fantastic agencies from small to big, from volunteer, 100% volunteer to, to big career departments. Um, but I've also seen some departments that are just stuck. They're spinning their wheels and they're not getting the things that they need and they're not providing the services their community wants because they just have, they're stuck in the way of doing things from the 50s. We look at tradition versus progress. And sometimes we think, and I actually had a chief tell me this, we can't have both. You can't follow our traditions, our proud fire service traditions, and I am proud of them as well. Um, and progress at the same time. And that kind of goes back to the slide from Backdraft. Um, I'm not a believer in that. I think we can do both. We can look at our traditions and hold them dear to us, um, but also progress and put on things like turnout gear and, and uh, safe processes and that type of thing. I read recently an interesting article about um, a challenge that they face at uh, Viacom Networks, which is CBS, which uh, owns a ton of things, um, including MTV. And they've just put in two new executives in charge of the MTV division, I guess, of, of uh, Viacom. And you know, when I was a kid and MTV debuted, it was music television and it was nothing but videos and VJs. And if you watch MTV nowadays, it's not certainly not what it was when I was a kid or, or a lot of you guys probably were, were young. Um, one of the things they discovered at MTV is that in order for them to stay relevant and make money, especially in this era now with streaming and, and ad, you know, commercials aren't the thing that they were, um, they have to blow their entire model up every seven years or so. Uh, so they kind of reinvent themselves all the time. They're constantly changing. And they bring in these new managers and these new leaders to, to facilitate this process. Um, and one of the things, you know, sometimes it works well and sometimes it doesn't. And one of the things one of these gentlemen talked about was that you thrive and change or you die and change. Uh, and that's kind of the mantra there at MTV and that they keep reinventing themselves. Maybe we need to look at that. Maybe we need to reinvent ourselves every now and then. And there are agencies that do this, certainly. Um, but I think as a whole, we're kind of slow to embrace this type of thing. So why do organizations change? Uh, why do we make these differences either in policy procedure or SOP or, or overall the whole agency? Um, <clears throat> a couple of classic things include the list here. Um, crisis, 9-11 is a big example of this for us as a fire service and the number of changes that came out um, following 9-11. Um, it really triggered us to have to make these, make these changes. Performance gaps are another one. You know, we suddenly realize that we're not doing the job we're supposed to putting out the fires or more often dealing with patients in, a, in an effective or caring or compassionate way. Uh, new technologies roll out. Um, you know, I can remember starting in paper reports, you know, doing multi-form paper patient care reports. Uh, and that has changed at this agency uh, and a lot of other agencies as we've adopted laptops and tablets and that type of thing. Um, but does your agency really adapt to new technology as much as it should? Um, a lot of people talked about the slicers controversy as new technology, it's a new technology. Um, not really technology, it's a new way of doing things, but we need to look at these things and adapt. Are there new opportunities for us, community paramedicine or, or whatever the formal term is, mobile integrated healthcare? Um, you know, this pandemic, I think, has shown us that there are a lot of things that we don't normally think of as our job in the fire service that maybe we're now going to be pushed into doing. And maybe we need to get ahead of that. Assisting with, you know, mass vaccination clinics. I've had chiefs say, I'm not going to do that. We're not going to do that. Why should we do that? Because we're the fire department. That's why we should do that. Sometimes you have internal and external pressure to change. Um, sometimes you just change because you can. Uh, that's not always a good thing. 
Um, you know, we don't want necessarily to toss out changes just because, well, screw things up. Um, what's that? Uh, what's that term that they use nowadays? A disruptor. Someone comes in and changes everything around just because they can, um, or it just sounds good. Well, shit, let's do this. Sorry, excuse my language there. Uh, let's change things, and uh, sounds like a good idea. Let's try it. Uh, oftentimes, that one is uh, a recipe for failure. Sounds good. Let's try it, and then there's really no strategy behind it, and it just falls flat on its face. So what can you change as, as an organization? Well, we can change our mission and vision to start with. Um, you know, you can boil your mission down to the real simple Phoenix thing, be nice, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I think sometimes that's a good thing. I can remember coming on in the fire service and my predecessor in this job, uh, they had gone through a whole mission process and uh, they went with this corporate thing and we had a mission and vision and they were four and a half pages long and nobody was gonna remember it. Um, so we changed it. We changed it into a mission that I think probably still no one remembers it because we know what our mission is. You know, we know what that mission is. It's pretty simple. Um, but we can look at our mission and visions and change those as, as needed as we evolve as an agency. Uh, technology, like we talked about, adapting new technology. Thermal imaging cameras, biggest thing when I was young. You know, uh, department right down the road from me, they've just uh, purchased a little personal tick for every guy on the department. Uh, kind of blows my mind in some ways. That, that that's what we're doing. But then the flip side is you look at, is that where we need to focus on things? Uh, is that the technology? We don't fight a lot of fire anymore. You know, should we look at other uh, things for technological improvements that we could do? Uh, they've been talking for years about ultrasound in the field and those kind of things. Maybe we need to look at those kind of things. Um, human behavioral, which is providing new knowledge and skills for our people, you know, constantly giving them new things to do. Um, and sometimes this is, is hard to do depending on your organization. Um, if the union is a partner with you, if you have a union or your firefighters, volunteer firefighters association, um, are they partners or are they not? And that's gonna help or hinder you in, in the process of change. Looking at um, new ways that work can be done, a task job design. Uh, can we do things differently? Um, Sometimes we can, sometimes we can even look at the classic things we do. Maybe there's a new way to pull that cross lay. Maybe there's a new cross lay we can use that will help make our job more efficient and effective. Uh, our organizational structure, certainly can look at that. Um, you know, there are departments, I can remember a department that was laying off guys, but still had, uh, it was a small size municipal department, um, laying off guys from the suppression and EMS side, and, uh, but didn't touch their chiefs. So you had a, a chief, a deputy chief, and then five additional chiefs in a department that was doing maybe 5,000 calls a year. So when that chief retired and a new one came in, they changed up that organizational structure to make it more realistic uh, and, and reflective of what they, they were doing. And then last but not least, you can work on your organizational culture, but how easy is that one to change? Um, you know, each of us in our own departments has our own culture and, um, that one sometimes is the one we identify is that we need to change, but that's the one that takes time and it's a tough one. Um, that's the one that if you wanna really work on that change and some places really do need to, um, it's gonna take a lot, of, a lot of effort and a lot of work. So you may wanna start somewhere easier first. I love this quote from Admiral Harper, uh, Hopper, sorry. Um, you know, the most dangerous phrase in the language is we've always done it this way. Um, and sometimes that does hold true and it helps, but it doesn't always. We've always done it this way. We've always put guys up on the roof to cut a hole. Okay, well, made sense then. Does it really make sense now? You know, UL, science, FDNY, FDNY of all people is showing us that this isn't the smartest thing to do. Um, so we've always done it this way. Maybe we wanna get that out of, our, uh, out of our lexicon and move into, well, we've always looked at new things. We've always been open. We've always been willing to adapt at least willing to look at things and, and learn. So our history would change. How have we done? Um, we're, as I said, you know, we're not always the best as an organization uh, at, at adapting. So I've kind of boiled it into four key areas. Um, and these are areas that are just of interest to me and there could be others as well. Um, safety. So let's look at safety, health and wellness, diversity, and emergency medical services. So safety, you know, how have we done? 
And this is the part, you know, in an actual conference presentation we had all discussed. I don't know how well that works in Zoom. Um, but how have we done um, with safety? You know, you can break safety into a couple key components for us as the fire service, uh, PPE, uh, tactics and strategy, leadership, and then kind of our overall safety philosophy. Uh, and in PPE, I'd, I'd say we, with the exception of the helmets, you know, we've done pretty well. Uh, when I came on the fire department in 1986, uh, my first set of turnout gear included a cotton duck, duck jacket that went down to about uh, my knees, and I had the three-quarter roll-up boots. And my helmet was a riot helmet made by Federal Signal uh, with a big old face shield. Um, and I rode the back step for about eight months until they finally put the stop to that. We've since evolved with our PPE. You know, everybody wears turnout gear now. Now, was this a choice or was it pushed on us? It was kind of pushed on us, but we did. Even FDNY was an early adopter. Boston Fire Department was an early adopter. Uh, FDNY went so far as to buy two sets of turnout gear for every guy um, so that they were always covered and there was no excuse to say, oh, my gear's wet. I got to go back to the old stuff. Um, but even 10, 12 years after FDNY, the biggest fire department in the country, adopted turnout gear and purchased it for their guys. There was an article, and I think it was Fire Chief Magazine at the time, in which they were interviewing the commissioner of the Chicago Fire Department. And apparently with a straight face, the commissioner said, we're still evaluating turnout gear. And these guys, this is the late 90s, the guys were in long coats and, and three-quarter roll-up boots. Um, so sometimes we lag because we like the way things are done. You know, you still have departments where guys aren't wearing protective hoods um, because, you know, you still have to feel that burning on your ears uh, to know when it's dangerous. But overall in PPE, I think we've done a good job adapting. A lot of it, as I said, has been pushed onto us. In tactics and strategy, we're doing a pretty decent job, I think, changing. Um, there's a lot I think we could do and learn from other agencies, other places in the world uh, and how they do things. But you know, we've adapted to a safety, more of a safety culture. Sometimes a lot of agencies just give lip, lip service to that, but we have made that change because we've seen what happens. Um, you know, another one to look at was, uh, was FDNY prior to 9-11. Uh, there were two years in the 90s where FDNY had 11 line of duty deaths over this two year period. And at that time, uh, they had a deputy chief named James Murtaugh. And he was, one of his many roles, but he was over, over uh, training and safety for FDNY. And what they determined to do, what, and looking at their, st their statistics and these fatalities, they determined that people were dying because they were forgetting the basics of our job. Um, because we were piling so much stuff in the hazmat and tech rescue and all the stuff that gets a cool YouTube video with a guitar riff, they were forgetting the very basics of how to pull hose how to raise a ladder safely, uh, very basic. So what they determined in FDNY, an apartment at that time of 12,000 firefighters, is that every single company would go back to the academy once a week for the back to basics program. And this would progress until everyone had the, the skills back down. So we have adapted a safety culture because we don't wanna see our guys killed. Um, but still, sometimes there's, there are holdouts on that. Um, and I think we can see that some now with our pandemic, with guys who don't want to wear a mask. I don't want to wear a mask. Well, put the darn thing on. You know, as a department that suffered through approximately 30% of my workforce being out at one point due to COVID, um, you know, we wear our masks in the station now. And, you know, it's pain, but you do it because it's for safety and we have to be careful with that. Our leadership training. Um, this is an area that's always interested me and I think we lag seriously as the fire service. Oops, wrong, wrong one. Um, you know, we haven't always been great at training leaders. Uh, fire service is great at doing a test and taking the guy who tests the highest and saying, congratulations, you're the Lieutenant, Sergeant, Captain, whatever, good luck. Uh, and we don't really do a whole lot organizationally to train these people. I think we lag behind our friends on the law enforcement side where they have a lot more resource for this and really do provide a little bit more training. And not every agency, obviously, there's some that do a good job. So safety, you know, kind of checkered, but I think overall we've done a pretty decent job at adapting. Philosophy-wise, safety officers, we've got them out there. 
Um, we've really adapted to that. And as that happened in the 90s, and I, one of the classes I've taught uh, and teach in the past is uh, incident safety officer certification. And there's more acceptance now to the role of the safety officer and the importance. And I think part of that also was it was pushed on us by the NFPA, but, but we've gotten there. We're moving towards that direction. Health and wellness, two big things, our fitness physically and emotionally slash mentally. Um, right now, I think as a fire service, we're very focused, good, and, and this is a good thing, on the, the mental health component of firefighting and emergency medical service um, with suicide prevention and also a focus on PTS and um, its all its effects and how we deal with that. And that's a good thing. You know, we're finally coming to that point where, okay, now we need to deal with this. We need to talk about these issues that are going on because it's affecting our guys. Unfortunately, we seem to only be able to focus on one thing at a time. Um, so the health, the physical fitness side is, is lacking. You know, I, it's always kind of fun to see the, the new calendar that comes out from FDNY with their oiled up shiny people or the Southern Florida firefighters. And then you walk out into your day room and you see what you're, what you're dealing with. Um, it astounds me that we are so proud in the fire service of talking about how we're fire combat, we're professional athletes and we need to train like it and all this kind of stuff. Um, and then some departments say, okay, you need to maintain your physical fitness standards for your first two or three years on the job. But after that, you don't have to worry about it. Why? State troopers can do it for their entire career. Um, you know, it shouldn't be a choice. And this has been something that, you know, we jumped on quickly. Uh, NFPA with 1500 talked about it when it came out, we jumped on, we all bought a treadmill and we put it in the bay and, and you're working on it and it kind of died out a little bit. Um, so we really, I think, have done a poor job on that and we need to really work on it. We still have 28% or so of the fire service smokes. Why? Especially now with workers' comp issues and presume cancer presumption. Tell the guys they got to stop. It's that simple. We did it here with volunteers and with career guys, so you can do it. Um, and then our cancer prevention has been a big thing too that we've really jumped into, which is good. Um, but we like the flashy things, cancer prevention. And now it's great. The vendors can come out with new hoods and new turnout gear that will keep you from getting carcinogens. Um, all that's great, but if you're still 300 pounds and you can't, do the job very well without, uh, you can't go up a couple of flights of stairs without huffing and puffing. That's not gonna help you at all. You know, we need to deal with that health and wellness side of things. It's a change that we don't necessarily want to adapt to. Diversity and inclusion is one of my favorite pictures uh, from some department in California. Um, how many of your departments actually look like this? You know, not most of us. Um, fire service overall, there's approximately 8% are women, 8% are women. Um, and our, our numbers with uh, protected minority groups are, are not great either. Um, it's traditionally been a white working class field. Uh, you know, you look at New York and Boston with Irish and strong Irish and Polish and Italian history with these, with the fire service, and that's wonderful. But we also need to open up. Um, and this is a change that has been really difficult, I think, for the fire service. And again, not everywhere. Southern California departments tend to do better than the rest of us nationally. Um, and as the Ohio Fire Chiefs, we've recognized this and President Anderson launched uh, Diversity and Inclusion Task Force, which kicks off uh, in January. So hopefully we can help with this. But there, this is a change that it's tough. The guys don't necessarily want people who are different in the fire service. Um, and we need to reflect the communities that we serve. It's that simple. You know, I've been a fire instructor for 20 plus years. Um, and yeah, I've certainly had some women recruits who shouldn't make it through to be a firefighter, but I've also had a lot of guys who shouldn't. Um, and I've had a lot of women who can kick everyone's butt and get the job done. Uh, you know, if people wanna do it, let's get them in the fire service. Let's get them through the door. On the volunteer side of things, you know, it's a struggle to get anybody. So take them all in. And sometimes our volunteer side of the component in, in the volunteer fire service does a little bit better job than our career side uh, because they just need people. <laughs> you know, you're a warm body, come on in. Um, 
So diversity inclusion hasn't been a great change for us. It's been a struggle and it's ongoing. Uh, and we need to keep working on that one. And then EMS. Uh, EMS has not, in my mind, you know, when probably the 70s, Roy and Johnny uh, with emergency, it looked really cool. Everything they did was neat. They had the biggest district apparently on the planet from the mountains right down to the ocean and the desert and downtown. Um, but have we really full-throated <laughs> adopted our EMS role? Uh, and I would argue that a lot of us do not, that EMS still remains the redheaded stepchild, even though 90% of EMS in this country, 911 EMS, is provided by the fire service. Um, I can remember the 80s, a lot of chiefs jumping into this and seeing it as a revenue driver and all this kind of thing, but it's still not taken that seriously. Uh, the guys, you know, People, you know, you're assigned to the medic your first couple of years, then you promote up to the engine. Um, why? How many of us are fighting fires on a very regular basis? I saw an astounding stat uh, came from, I think, John, a study that Johns Hopkins did, that with the exception of the major departments in this country, a uh, fire officer may only go to about 20 to 25 actual all hands working fires in their entire career nowadays. Now that speaks volumes for our prevention side. Um, but maybe our focus is in the wrong place. EMS is what we do. If you have EMS in your department, that's what's keeping you going. Um, that's what the people see. So we really need to, I think, adapt and really take it on as something that's important. You know, you look at FDNY, they took on EMS, they merged. A paramedic who starts makes less than a firefighter. Paramedic, that makes no sense whatsoever. Firefighters in FDNY going about 400,000 calls a year, which is a lot. Um, EMS is doing 1.8 million plus. You know, so there's no parity there and there should be. And we really need to look at that in the fire service and find ways to better deliver what we do. In the picture there, you see a community paramedic from Manatee County down in Florida. Um, this has been a struggle for us. Everyone jumped on the bandwagon. We love the idea and then there's laws and everything, but then we don't really want to do it. Do we really want? Do we want to take a guy off a fire engine and make him do this community paramedic stuff? Uh, this is our future people. Fires aren't. We need to really make this change uh, into you know, high performance emergency medical services and really get it going. You know, you're gonna have the guy who says, well, yeah, but then they call me at four o'clock in the morning for something stupid. Well, maybe the community paramedic part can help avoid that. So let's look at ways that we can get uh, EMS really working well for us. So why is change difficult for us? Um, well, the number one reason for change resistance is fear. We fear things, oops, sorry. Oh. Uh, uncertainty feeds our fear. We fear change because we can't anticipate the outcome all the time. It's tough, it's frightening. In our personal lives, we fear that, and also as an organization. When we accept that life's uh, you know, not always, everything's not written in stone for us, it makes us suffer as people and as an organization. Um, and that fear, fear of failure will feed our aversion to change. We're just afraid, we don't wanna do it as leaders. You know, if you embark on a big strategic planning process and identify all these things that we need to change and modify and adopt, um, it's a little terrifying to think, what if we can't get it done? What if we don't do it? Well, it's easier than not to do it. So we need to get over that fear and work on ways to not be so afraid. So how can we overcome these fears, especially when we're the boss, we're the leaders, we go out and we say, okay, people, this is what we're going to do. We're going to change our entire organization. We're gonna adopt, we're gonna adapt and take on the emergency medical service transport side of things, let's say. So we need to, as the leaders, acknowledge the change. You know, acknowledge that there's gonna be a big change. Acknowledge that people might be afraid, including yourself. We need to acknowledge that and make it clear. Most importantly, we need to communicate. Poor communication will destroy any change effort that you make. So you need to communicate frequently. And in corporate world, they say over-communicate. So we need to listen also and accept feedback. You know, just because you have the idea doesn't mean that you're the only one who's gonna make this happen. So we need to listen and go from there. Sometimes people have better ideas than we do and it's hard to accept. 
you know, I've got five horns, you don't, but um, we need to, to really listen and get that feedback. We need to focus on the positives for everybody. They need to understand that when we get to where we're going or where we want to be, it's gonna be a better thing for us. We may have some struggles along the way, but it's gonna be a good thing for us. And this is why. We need to be flexible. You know, you may get out your Gantt charts and all this kind of corporate organizational management stuff uh, and then may have to deviate from that a lot, a little bit or a lot. And that's okay. You know, you keep your eyes on the prize and you keep moving towards it. It might be in fits and lurches, but you keep moving that process forward. And then be realistic. We have to be realistic with what's gonna happen. Don't promise the world and then we get to where we're going and suddenly it's not as cool as I made it sound. So we really need to keep everyone's expectations realistic. Um, one of the things I've noticed over the years is sometimes you're well, even a small program and you see some of these guys get so excited and they're like, oh, this is gonna happen. And suddenly you hear these amazing things that this program is gonna do that you never even intended. You know, well, guys, we need to, let's tamp that down and let's keep this a little bit realistic. Other factors that are gonna to contribute to our guys and gals uh, being averse to this change include, again, bad communication. If you're not telling people um, what's gonna happen, it's not gonna work. Uh, people fear their loss of control, especially if we're gonna make a, a big department-wide organizational change. Uh, you may have supervisors and people who have their little empires uh, who feel they're, they're gonna lose control over things. And um, that's gonna lead to that aversion to change. It could be poor timing, you know, maybe, you're building two new stations and you're in the midst of a massive recruiting campaign because your numbers are down and suddenly the chief thinks, well, hey, this is a great time to, uh, to adapt to a uh, community-wide paramedicine program. Um, poor timing. We need to really tackle the things that we can tackle at one time. There's a lack of reward. People will see that as a problem. Um, I don't, you know, okay, fine, chief. We're going to make this change. We're going to adapt. Uh, we're going to start this massive fire prevention program and everyone's involved. What's it? What, what's in it for me? Um, that's a typical, very typical uh, attitude. We have to be prepared for that and tell them what's in it. It goes back to letting them know what the positives are going to be. You could also be dealing with your own agency politics and peer pressure. I mentioned earlier, you know, if you've got those, um, like a better term, ancillary organizations, a union, a local, or a firefighters association group or something, get them on board. You're going to need their help, especially in a union uh, atmosphere. You're going to need their help um, to make some big changes. So try and avoid those politics and get people on, on board. We all know that in our organizations, you know, okay, you can be the chief, this guy's the deputy chief, you got the lieutenants and captains, and then you got the guy who's been on the job for 36 years as a volunteer or as a career guy or as a part-timer. Uh, and he holds a lot of sway over people or she. Um, so they may be putting pressure, especially if they don't agree. So we need to jump in and get people on board with us and try and avoid those politics. Uh, you may also encounter people who worked somewhere else or even in your own place. And we tried this once before and it didn't work. Um, doesn't mean it's not gonna work again. So we have to be able to overcome that. Lack of trust and support. The troops just don't trust or support you. This probably points to a bigger issue. And maybe that change isn't what you need to do. Uh, you need to look at that. And then they're still connected to the old way. This is the old way. We've always done it this way. Why change now? Um, you know, maybe we need to make that change, so. So once we start and we decide what we're gonna do, how do we manage this process? As you know, I've talked about, we've gotta, you gotta keep it on track. So as the leader, how are we gonna do that? How are we gonna keep everybody focused and get this project through? And it's a tough job, I will tell you that. Um, you know, early in my career, um, you know, I jumped on the bandwagon of strategic planning and uh, we got a whole group together we had our, some of our paid guys and a bunch of our volunteers and even brought in some people from the community. Um, and we followed the whole process and we researched processes and what's the best. And we kind of went with what we thought was the easier one. Um, and we did our, uh, you know, all of our assessments and everything like that. Um, and we came up with a six point strategic plan over 10 years that we wanted to get implemented. Um, 
and we got we got some of that done certainly and you know i'm sitting in a new fire station that was part of that plan um 15 years ago at this point um but a lot of it never got implemented you know people are excited from the start and then that excitement wanes off because things take time um and then you find that you may be the only one who's doing it and you don't have time to really marshal this through. So how do we get these changes to work? Um, so first off, what is change management? Well, it's an entire discipline. Um, you know, you can get a doctorate in change management, but it's drawn from multiple areas, including psychology, which was my field in college, uh, behavioral science, um, workflow, systems management, and engineering. Um, and it's all about getting these things from the conceptual through to the end point and beyond. Um, change management is what's been done in corporations for years. Henry Ford was a big one who developed this. Um, there are multiple models out there for, for you to choose from. Uh, you can buy things, you can get consultants to come in and help you with all that stuff. Um, but our central idea here is that no change ever happens in isolation as an organization. Personally, certainly. But as an organization, if we're gonna make significant changes, it's not gonna happen just in my office. It's gonna happen for this entire organization. Um, the changes impact the whole organization and every person in it. Uh, so we have to be cognizant of that constantly. Um, and that if we do this well, we're gonna encourage everyone to adapt to and embrace our new way. Does that mean you're gonna have 100% buy-in? No, we never do. There's always, the crossed arm guy, typically the guy uh, who just sits there and glares, <laughs> you know? Um, we may not be able to change everybody, but if we can change the majority of things and move this project forward, that's, that's a very good thing. So there's four principles of change management in general in a global sense. So number one is understand change. Number two is plan for change. Number three is implement it. And number four is communicate it. Very very simple. Uh, so understanding it. Number one, understanding it. So why are we changing? What are our core objectives of this change? And you've got to get that out there. You've got to figure that out before you start this. Before you roll it out to the troops, you and whoever else is working on this, what's our objective? What do we want to get to? What will the benefits of this change be for organization? You know, is there a reason to do this? Is it just looking cool? Let's get a ladder truck. Yeah, okay. Let's do all this work and planning and we'll train everyone. And then suddenly we realize we don't have a building over one story in town and uh, every house has a massive lawn with trees in front of it. So we'll never be able to uh, swing that ladder up. Um, how is it gonna impact our people per, uh, positively? What are the positives for them? Uh, we need to know that because they need to know that. Is it going to, and how so, if so, uh, is it gonna affect our workflows? Um, you know, is it going to change the way we do our job, either as a paid person or as a volunteer? Uh, and then what do we need to give our people for them to be successful? You know, this is about an organization, but the core of any organization is the people who work there. So we have got to keep this as our priority throughout any change process. I apologize for the background. There's apparently a riot going on outside my office. Um, but, um, you know, we need to keep that focus on our people. And how is this going to affect them? Now we need to plan that change. So we need to look at sponsorship. And sponsorship is just our nice corporate way of saying um, engaging high-level support and sponsorship. So again, if you've got a union, let's get them on board. If you've got the Firefighters Association, let's get that on board. If you've got Jim, who's been here for 107 years, let's get him on board to help push this through and to get it done. Uh, if you've got a board of trustees, you know, township politics are like nothing else in the world, I've learned. Um, you know, try and get them on board, your city council, however, you know, you got to do it, your public safety director. Get these people on board to help with this change. Then look at your organization. Who is best positioned to help us? How are we going to get this thing designed and implemented? Um, are they internal? Are they external? Can we work with other people? Do we need a consultant? Um, be careful on that world because people will promise you the world and don't always deliver. Uh, or can we do it ourselves? Can we make it through ourselves? How are we going to win support for buy-in? How are we going to get everybody to, um, to help us? 
How are we going to get them to support this? So let's figure that out. And then probably most importantly, what is success going to look like? How are we going to know we've done it? Now, it could be we just opened a fire station. Yay, that's our success. We know it's done. Um, but if you're looking at bigger changes in terms of your organization or procedures or your culture, what's our endpoint? How do we know? How do we evaluate that change? Number three is implementing the change. So number one, we have to ensure that all our stakeholders, everyone who's involved, they understand what we're doing and why we're doing it. Again, we have to agree on success criteria. How are we gonna evaluate this and how do we know we've done the right thing and that we're done with it? Um, determine who's, in uh, who's gonna be involved with implementation and what their level of involvement is. You know, you've got staff, you know, career, volunteer, part-time, whatever. Uh, you've got people in the department who could be your change agents. Um, how do we get them involved? Don't just necessarily keep this to your command staff. Go out, go forth and bring in the guys and gals who actually do the job on a regular basis. My guys like to joke about, you know, as, as our department's evolved, I've gone you know, less on medic calls and more to a point where I uh, apparently just shuffle papers. I show up on a scene and I shuffle papers. Um, so get these people, get your shift commanders, get the senior firefighters, get the newest guy to buy in and work with you and figure out what their job is. It could just be a small job, but it's important. And that gets them involved and gets them to buy in. Then with that, appoint, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, appoint change agents. And these are people who are going to really push this through. They're your cheerleaders. They're your workhorses, your Sherpas, for lack of a better term, who are going to help us um, really move this thing along. Identify any training needs. You know, is there a training that has to be done? Do we need to roll out something new so people understand what's going on? Um, sorry about that. Um, so that has to be addressed and it has to be planned for. And then make sure everyone is supported. You know, we have to constantly, do we have buy-in? Are there questions? What's going on? Let's keep these guys happy and going forth. Um, it just makes everyone, it makes the process better. And then principle four, communicate the change. Again, communication on this is going to be make or break. Um, if you communicate it well, people are going to understand. But if me and the captain know we're changing everything and no one else does, it's not going to work at all. So there's a model out there you can use to address in your communications when you're communicating change. It's called the ADCAR change management model. Uh, it was developed by a nonprofit think tank. Um, and I think it's called the Pius Institute, which is an interesting name. But um, ADCAR stands for awareness, desire, knowledge, ability, and reinforcement. So where it's awareness of the need for change. FDNY, guys, we've had 11 guys die in the last two years, we need to make a change. Something is not right. We need to make a change. The guys bought in. Uh, communicate the desire. We want you in here. We want you working on this change. We want you to help design this new process. Uh, the knowledge of how we change. You know, this is what's going to happen. These are the steps that we're looking at. Um, communicate the ability to change. You know, we can do this as an organization. We've been here for 110 years. We're going to be here for 110 more and we can do this. And then reinforcement. We have to constantly reinforce to sustain this change, change, change long term. We're going to have to keep going. Just because we finish, we get to whatever our end goal was, doesn't mean that we're done. You know, okay, now we're there. Now we have to keep reminding people why we're here and why this was good. And now we need to move on because now you're going to start having those voices. That you thought they were on board, but now they're like, well, it was better in the old days. Well, maybe it was easier in the old days, but this is what we're doing now because this is why, you know, guys were dying and we had to make this change. Some mistakes that you can run into in change management, <clears throat> excuse me, it's starting too late. You know, uh, we had five guys uh, killed, let's say in the last year, and uh, we need to address it. So we're going to start addressing it five years later. That doesn't work. We can't do that. It's starting too late. But there's no strategy and no winning strategy for getting this change done. Okay, we're going to make a massive cultural shift in this fire department and 
we're going to change the work ethic and all this kind of stuff. And how are we going to get there? Well, I have no idea. Figure it out. That's not going to work. Uh, the fanfare failure is what it, it's referred to in the corporate world, that we announce these big changes, we roll things out, we're going to give everyone a mug saying, you know, MTFR 2026, you know, that's how we're, that's what we're going, that's our tagline, and then nothing really happens. We had a big party, everyone got a mug, and yeah, everything's stagnant and not changing. Um, we also want to make sure our people don't hear it from others first. They need to hear it from you. If you're the chief, this is your project then you need to be the one to announce it and to tell the guys about it. They should not hear it from watching a video of a council meeting where you brief the council on your project. That's not a good way. Um, we fail when we don't make a compelling case. You know, if you're the chief and you're the great uh, thinker in the department, but maybe you're not the most personable person, get the assistant chief on. And if she is uh, really good at, you know, talking and, and communicating, have her be the face of it. You know, that's fine. You know, um, make the compelling case. And then we also fail when we think that everyone's going to be as excited about this as, as you are. You know, this was my idea. I love it. It's great. It's for the best. And you go out and everyone's like, oh, whatever. Um, don't let that stop you. But we have to, you know, realize that not everyone's going to embrace change like maybe you want to or you want them to. It might seem like a great idea. We're getting rid of pagers and we're going to active 911. Don't, don't do that. Um, and you're really excited about it, but they may not be. So be, be prepared for that. Again, lack of communication. I can't hammer that in enough. We have to constantly communicate to people um, and get out there and talk to them. Don't necessarily put everything out in the memo. Get out there and talk. Um, our change is a big one and we don't have enough leadership. Uh, this is what happened, uh, you know, in my world with the strategic planning thing. Um, you know, we hit the low-hanging stuff quickly, and then the the uh, higher branch stuff. Um, everyone kind of you know, abandoned us, and it was me. And suddenly, you realize you have all this work to do, plus your regular job, and it's just not going to work. And you need to have you know enough leadership to see this through and to get it done. You're also ignoring your department culture, perhaps that could be a mistake. Um, as I said, each of us has a different kind of culture in our fire departments, and some of us may be very grounded in tradition. You know, we look at certainly fire departments, you all know them, that everything is based in tradition. This is what we've always done. This is what we always will do. Um, so maybe you're not uh, acknowledging that, that your culture exists and, and how we work through that. Um, and it, just an interesting side note on that, I was just talking to a friend of mine last night who is a university faculty member. And he was talking about the new dean who's come into the school that he's in. Um, and very brilliant person and apparently very successful. She came from outside um, right at the beginning of the pandemic. And since then, she hasn't been in the office at all. Uh, apparently she has some medical issues that make her feel like she needs to certainly like quarantine in a basement bunker or something like that. The problem is, you know, she wants to make changes, but she doesn't understand the culture of her own departments. You know, she's over a school that has like five or six different departments in, a lot of students. Um, she's never walked the hallways. She's never met the people, listened to the conversation, sat down and had a cup of coffee with faculty or staff. Um, and that's the same thing that we can run into. The chief never steps foot in the fire station. Uh, admins in another building all together and doesn't come over unless someone's in trouble. Um, so we need to break that get with the guys and gals and get them to buy in um, and involve them in our process. Uh, we may also stall because we don't have lack of, we've got a lack of skills and uh, resources, especially financial, it's a big issue. Don't jump into something huge if you don't have a way to pay for it. You know, Maybe it's gonna be grant funded. Okay, well then let's keep our expectations under control until we get that grant. Another killer is just focusing on the long-term. This is what it's gonna be. We're going to Valhalla, people. It's going to be fantastic. Um, but there are going to be bumps along the road. And we need to be aware of that and let the guys know this is going to happen. We're going to see these issues in this process along the way. Um, you know, one of the things I look at here at our new fire station, um, it's a beautiful facility. You're all welcome to come see it Sunday. Um, but I think we moved in a little bit too soon. Um, we had a lot of pressure from our board to move in. 
Uh, we had a buyer for our, for our previous place. Uh, so, you know, you keep this focus in the long term, but we also have to let the guys know, okay, well, the station alerting system will be working. You know, we're, we're gonna get there. Um, we have these little hiccups. Yes, we're gonna deal with the internet issue. We're gonna deal with this and Spectrum still hasn't moved the cable over. We're getting that stuff. So we have to not just focus on, you guys all have your own bedrooms now, but also on these little hiccups along the road. And then it can't be this excessively open-ended process. You know, we have to have benchmarks and goalposts to get to, otherwise it's just gonna go on forever. And no one likes that, especially a firefighter EMT. So then people say, well, what, well, chief, what leadership do I do? Is this the autocratic, the laissez-faire, all that kind of craziness? Um, the best leadership style for this is the one that gets you to where you need to be. And you may have to adapt. There is no one size fits all uh, approach. That's the perfect way. You know, you're gonna have to change your leadership style from time to time. Um, I've taught leadership classes and I always kind of, you know, I think it's funny when we, we you have to classify yourself as what kind of leader are you? What's your style? You better be able to adapt or you're not a good leader. You know, know your people. You may, one guy, you have to yell at to get him to do anything because he likes that kind of thing. Other people, you have to sit and talk to them and convince them. You've got to know the people and change your style appropriately as needed. Stay authentic to yourself. Don't try and be something you're not though. Um, Hopefully you're a strong communicator. That's the best thing for a change, uh, change manager and change agent. You're a coalition builder. We can get the people together. Um, and you're a strategic thinker. You know, that's the whole thing. And hopefully if you're a department leader uh, of a department of any size, you're strategic. And I don't mean, you know, we say strategic thinking and people are like, well, I, I never took a college class in that. I don't care. Whoopee, you know, I never took a college class in fire chief. But, uh, you know, I, it's just how you think. Are you thinking the big picture uh, or are you more immediate? And as a fire chief, hopefully you are thinking the big picture and as a strategic person. So in conclusion, I wanted to try and keep this under an hour for you guys, so I, hopefully we've done that. So in conclusion, um, remember change isn't easy and it's not gonna be painless, but it can be done well if we do it well. Be ready for those unexpected twists along the way. They're definitely going to be there. They're going to hit you. I, I, you know, you can probably look at any fire department, government agency, corporation, and ask them how well implementation of major changes have gone. Um, and there's hiccups always, from the people to the processes, everything. Remember, a chapter is not the book. That's right out of my like Gandalf type thing. Uh, and that failure, <laughs> failure is a stop, not the destination. Um, we might fail in a, along the way a couple of times, but we keep going. We want to keep pushing through so that we can get those changes made. You know, we have to focus as leaders, and this is hopefully what we do. What's best for the organization? What's best for my guys? What's going to get them what they need to get the job done? How can we be a better agency? How can we adapt and adopt new ways of doing things? What does my community need? You know, these are the important questions that we have to ask when we look at change and, and move forward. Um, you know, if, if you're in an upper class community, maybe you don't need an immunization program as you're <laughs> working with your fire department. Uh, but there's other things that you might need. Um, if you're in a lower end communities, maybe we need to look at free fire uh, smoke detectors and all those kind of things. So you gotta really tailor that change, make sure it makes sense. So remember, it's gonna be bumpy, but you can get it done. So any questions, you, I, I don't know if you can ask them on Zoom, I never really understand how this stuff works. Uh, or you can put them in the chat or uh, email me or send me a telegram, uh, which would be really cool. Um, or call me, They're my phone numbers, my digits. Um, or I guess we can take questions, I guess, is how this thing works. So um, I think I just, what did I do? Okay. So anyone has a question to ask, otherwise, thank you guys for joining us. Oh wait, what's that? So there was a question from Cameron Haller about um, the DNI task force. Aha. Uh -huh. I don't know if you can see that or not. Um, yep, I just saw it now, sorry. <laughs> um, Cameron, did you contact the OFCA directly? Yeah, he was he was one on the list. Was he on the list? Okay. 
Uh, let me go back and double check and make sure um, I sent an email. I thought to everybody, but I maybe may have missed them. So Cameron, don't worry, help us on the way. Um, and we're looking at kicking off. There are some delays, unfortunately, and we're looking at kicking that off in um, January because trying to do it now with December, you know how that goes, plus a pandemic. <laughs> so don't worry, Cameron, I'll get in touch with you. So if there's nothing else, thank you guys very much for your attention. And um, I believe you'll get a certificate or something from OFCA and uh, all will be good. And right. thank you, Misha. You're welcome. Thanks everybody for joining us. Have a good one. Bye-bye.